And welcome into the Press Box Studios in Midtown, Baltimore, Maryland. He's Glenn Clark, and I'm Gary Stein. And my man, Glenn, we're about to make history. Do you know that? I, you know what, Gary? First, before we do, I have to warn you. We always have to say it's we're in the live casino hotel studio well, of Press Box. I gotcha. do need to make sure that everybody knows that's where we are. But it's so good to see you, and I'm excited about this. This is the first show we're doing together a very maybe, long time. Maybe ever, and, actually. And actually the first show we've ever done with our shirts on. <laughs> Well, the audience didn't need to know about that. We're, I on, just, face, we're on Facebook Live, I just wanted so to let we you got know. to put on the shirts on this time. I would have preferred to have done it the way we used to. What about our pants, though? Can anybody no, see I, that? They remain Absolutely the same. Not. Exactly right. Absolutely not. Hey, the reason why we're making history today, Glenn and I, this is the first. This is the official first ever Premier Lacrosse League podcast, and it's right here, and it's right now on Facebook Live. It is called Premier Lacrosse League Weekly, or PLL Weekly. We're going to be here every Tuesday afternoon, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Facebook Live. Live, and uh, we're going to do this for the next 12 to 14 weeks, all the way up through the championships at the end of September. Uh, look, I had the opportunity, I think you did it as well, to check out the PLL this weekend. I know in the lacrosse world, of which, you know, you, obviously you with your play by play at UMBC and years covering college lacrosse. Uh, me at Loyola Stevenson, I, I certainly have a lot of excitement about this league and what could come for the sport and what it means big picture wise. I'm very excited about it. And it was kind of all the conversations just sort of been to this point like, wow, this is new and shiny. And then they're actually going to go out and play some lacrosse, and that's pretty interesting, too. And we're going to have, we have a good show for you today, Paul Rabel, who is basically the founder and the face of the league, and he is no stranger to lacrosse fans and probably sports fans in general. He's going to be our guest in about five or ten minutes. We're going to talk about his role, hit the formation of the league, why the league even exists, how the league is different, literally, than any other professional sports league in this country. And then later on at about 3.30, Eastern, 1230 uh, uh, Pacific, and I do mean to say that because their offices are located in Los ah, Angeles, ah. So, uh, and we'll talk to R.J. Kaminsky about that. R.J. is a local boy. He's from Baltimore. He went to Boys Latin High School, University of Maryland, was a journalism major, and he is their creator of content. They have a huge online presence. He's become this internet celebrity. He really man. has. He's really talented. Yeah. And so we're going to talk to him just about that role, about the social media content creation role, because I think out of all the leagues, that is really a huge part of this league. I think anytime you talk to anybody involved with the PLL, they'll drive that home and they'll say, we figured something out. And credit to Paul Rabel, because he was years ahead of this curve. He made himself marketable. You know, there have been a lot of lacrosse stars over the years, right? Some that have been good-looking, some that have been well-spoken, but none of them had the marketability that Paul Rabel had. And Paul really tapped in in the early going to the idea of our sport can live via social media and we can become a star via social media by putting ourselves out there a little bit, by not being afraid to embarrass ourselves a little bit, doing some silly things on social media. So I think this league exists in part, and we'll talk more about this with Paul Rabel, but in part because they've said this is the difference. This is how it works in 2019. If you want to grow a brand, if you want to do these types of things, you have to do the silly stuff that uh, our buddy RJ Kaminsky likes to do and that Paul Rabel has been doing for years and be willing to embrace that social media world. Well, and it's funny you say that because um, Paul Rabel for years, you know, he's never left the sport. He was a two-time NCAA champion at Hopkins back in the 2000s. I think it was 05 and 07, if I'm not mistaken. And then he was a 10-time All-Star in the MLL, the Major League Lacrosse. So he's never left the sport. He's seen what works. He's seen what doesn't work. And he's a progressive thinker, a forward thinker. And uh, he has really come on to a very different model here for the PLL. Before we get Paul on, let's just go over some of the facts and figures about this league. This league is unlike any other pro league in the country. Country, certainly in the history of the sport, there's no connection to a geographic location in the United States. There, there's no city, there's no state, there's no region, there's not the Baltimore somethings, the Philadelphia somethings, the Los Angeles somethings. They're not connected to a state. They have names. Obviously, it's a six-team league. They've got names, the Archers, the Atlas, the Chaos, the Chrome, the Redwoods, the Whip Snakes, but they're not affiliated with any geographic location in the country, and they're banking on the fact that this sport appealing to a younger demographic uh, is, you know, and with today's social media, fans are able to connect more directly with players, and that's kind of what they're banking on here. Gary, it's not all that dissimilar to what we've seen in the NBA. Now, let's be fair, obviously there's still teams and cities in the NBA. But it's but, a good point. But what's worked is fans of basketball 
are now embracing their favorite players, their stars. Well, and That's, players are basically calling the shots in basketball. Exactly now. right, and they're moving from town to town at whim and where they want to go, and we'll see that obviously again in the course of next week with free agency. But what ba- the NBA has wor- made work that they have banked on is – Instead of necessarily, sure, there'll be a handful of people in Portland or a handful of people in Cleveland that forever embrace their team no matter who's playing for them. But more than that, they embrace stars. They embrace the guys that they like the most, and they sort of go from team to team. And they will, if you rooted for LeBron James with the Cavaliers, you'll probably be inclined to root for LeBron James with the Miami Heat or with the Los Angeles Lakers. It has worked that way that they've made it a star-driven league. Yes, they still have the benefit of the, the cities in which the teams are loved and embraced and supported, but they have made it more of a star-driven league that's sort of what it seems to be working with PLL. And Paul Rabel is basically the face of the league, the founder of the league. There are other stars involved. Kyle Harrison, who also went to Hopkins and was an All-American there, he's involved. Uh, Tom Schreiber, who was an All-American at Princeton University, is involved as well. They all work in the, you know, the quote-unquote, we'll call it the front office, uh, and they're doing a great job. This is a fledgling league. There's no doubt about it. It's only been in existence on the field now for four weeks. They just competed in in their fourth week, just completed it here in Baltimore. They have uh, they started in Boston at Gillette Stadium up in New England. Then they went on to New York. They were in Chicago two weeks ago in the rain. My son actually was out there. And then uh, they uh, were in Baltimore this past weekend at Homewood Field. Hopkins, of course, the old stomping grounds of Rabel and Kyle Harrison and many of the other, other players in the PLL, the Premier Lacrosse League. And without further ado, I believe we are joined from the Los Angeles offices of the PLL. It is Paul Rabel, the founder of the league, one of the founders. And Paul, congratulations and welcome on to PLL Weekly. How are you? Uh, I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that intro. Hey, absolutely. And, you know, Glenn and I, Glenn uh, Clark is the co-host here, and I think you may have talked with him last week or two weeks ago. You know, we were discussing before the show began this afternoon, uh, like, like, how do you, how to describe the league? Because you're really doing something groundbreaking. No one has ever tried this in terms of a professional organized sports league. How would you describe in what terms what you're doing? Yeah, so we're a professional lacrosse league, and our uh, our name is the Premier Lacrosse League, and we always emphasize league because we have six teams competing over the course of a regular season to get a playoff position to ultimately win a championship, and that's the essence of pro sports, and in particular, team sports. Now, the difference between our league and many other team sports league is we've adopted the individual sports model, so think NASCAR or the PGA Tour, where you have the best players in the world or best, or best uh, race car teams touring across the country, embodying a full season of play, accumulating points to being named the ultimate winner at the end of the season. We felt like with a combination of new technology and new media, that with a nascent stage sport, with fewer participants and fewer viewers than what you have in critical mass sports like football, basketball, and baseball, that opened the opportunity up for us. And secondarily, the evolution of the stadium market, where you have MLS venues now that sit 25,000 people, or just last week when we were at Homewood, it managed to fit about 10,000 people into the venue for a Saturday night contest. So we're combining the essence of professional sports and competition with a little bit of a new age, modern appeal based on the tools we had. And we're talking with Paul Rabel, the founder of the Premier Lacrosse League, the PLL. This is PLL Weekly. Glenn Clark, my co-host, Gary Stein here as well. Paul, let me ask you before we get into the play and the last four weeks and what's actually happened on the field, take us before that. Take us to when you were on the hunt for venture capital, when you were germinating the idea. What type of research did you do and what types of people were you asking questions of to determine if this could work? Yeah, great question. And, and the short answer is just about everyone in professional sports business in particular. And some of our investors include Joe Sai, who's the owner of the Brooklyn Nets and co-founder of Alibaba, to Rain Ventures, which has seemingly a stake or have participated on the banking side of every major sports league and a lot of the emerging sports. And Churning Group, which is a media aficionado venture-backed um, investment co. And And then folks like CAA, Creative Artists Agency, which is one of the biggest talent and property consulting agencies in the world. So just our investor group alone has helped us uh, germinate, to use your word, 
uh, and evolve into the business that's in front of us right now, but also plan for the future. Right now we're tour-based, but the future uh, could mean that we garner enough interest, gather sponsorship, gather attendance, gather viewership, uh, and, and interest into our players and teams such that we then franchise back out into a traditional city-based model. Uh, but right now we felt like uh, that was the method based on some of the successful non-core sports leagues that have emerged over the last decade. And one more example I'll give you is, you know, what we talk about in, in really layman terms is try to do what the UFC did to MMA hmm. for lacrosse. And, and, you know, MMA has been around for centuries, and, and as has lacrosse, it's the oldest team sport in North America founded by the indigenous people. And uh, what we're trying to do is professionalize and commercialize it for the first time. Paul, first of all, uh, full disclosure, Paul was kind enough to invite myself, my family, down to the field before the game on Saturday night, which was really That's nice cool. of him, and I really appreciate And my two sons were just having the time of their life. They stole a ball, so you have to bill me for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but I, I, grabbed, I was going through my wife's bag, the diaper bag afterwards. I said, what the heck is the... Ah, whatever, we'll just <laughs> deal with it later. Um, w- one comment on that, Glenn, though, is that we're using optic yellow balls so one of the cool things about (laughs) building a pro league from scratch is we got to rethink everything and we changed some rules obviously the business model is a little bit different and it's true single entity and tour base but we did some things like hey let's look at uh the definition of of a television game and how it's consumed and one of the main main complaints had been previously that you can't track the ball it's small and it moves really fast that's true so we just pulled a lot of research from uh, the tennis associations that sunk millions of dollars into discovering the right <laughs> Pantone, and we just pulled the optic yellow, and it's been great. Oh, my, the people were wiling out about him. Everybody that was down on the field was trying to come away with one, and my four-year-old was the one that managed to snag one. So I, I, this was something that I, I'll give you again, full disclosure. I needed to see it, right? I needed to see it up close and personal to figure out what was going on. And I get it. This was particularly special on Saturday night. As you mentioned, 10,000 people. It was genuinely packed on Saturday night, and the electricity, the excitement that was felt within that. And I know that you've talked about sort of trying to create a Final Four type event in every city that you go to. How important was it for your entire company to have that first sellout event and night where, like, the electricity was just absolutely through the roof for everybody to really sort of buy in to what it is, the vision that you have for the PLL? Well, it was amazing. I appreciate that. Um, you know, we, we set out every week to exceed all of our metrics and assumptions. And, uh, and more importantly, though, we're looking to constantly iterate and learn. And, uh, and we're learning every week about what works and, you know, how to deal not only in a, in a, in a world where this is our first year and we've played four games over four weekends, I should say, but, uh, we're also creating a new market for professional lacrosse and in a season where professional sports typically avoid outside of Major League Baseball. And it's the competitiveness of summer months and youth lacrosse and youth sports and vacations and all these other kind of atmospheric events that go on. So uh, we've got, as I had mentioned earlier, we've got great uh, investors and strategic capital behind us. And we're building for the future, but we're constantly iterating. And while Homewood Field isn't an MLS venue, it's certainly one of, I believe, the most historic venue in lacrosse. That had a little bit to do with it. A night game had a little bit to do with it. Uh, but we're threading the needle across what's important to the business. And, and the three categories that I would say are most important is you have best players in the world, you have a mass distribution deal, which we do with NBC, and then you play at, at premium uh, venues where the atmosphere is exciting. So, you know, we, we just had our team meeting in L.A. this morning. You know, everyone... Uh, was very complimentary of the departments that we have that work in tandem together to get the event on Saturday night off the ground. Uh, and then we go back to work this week in Atlanta. Hey, Paul, and we're talking with Paul Rabel, the founder of the PLL. This is PLL Weekly. I want to talk a little bit about the players. Um, you know, it's interesting. A couple of things that I noticed, and Joe Keegan actually wrote about it on the website. You allow the players, or the league allows the players, to be, uh, when they're introduced, to have like a jersey, wear a jersey that has some personal meaning to them or maybe meaning to the city that they grew up in, etc., which is not something that other leagues are allowed to do, number 
number one. Number two, and he also wrote about this, John Haas has some great uh, goal celebrations, uh, and he had in college as well, but especially in the, in the uh, PLL. My question is, was there ever any particular discussion about how much you were going to let your players be themselves and have their personalities come out? Is that something that the league wants to see the players do? Oh, not only encourage them to be themselves, but support their personalities. And so, you know, that that's the essence of pro sports. There's an article out today in Axios about how professional sports across the board has turned into almost reality television. Mm. The NBA uh, just last night did their first award show with a red carpet that lived autonomously from previous awards being designated at the final home game of the recipient's uh, basketball stadium or basketball arena. Um, everyone's always evolving, and, and the most important dynamic and consumable asset that sports leagues have are the players, and that's what we talk about, being founded by the players and why our players have uh, stock options in the league in addition to elevated wages and health insurance. But on the support front, what we do tactically is help them create media so we can support their social accounts. Because if you look at a modern trend in sports, it's certainly spiked over time in parallel with interest of players, is the players' ability to communicate daily with their fans through social media. So we have a 15-person in-house media team that does creative and produces content on site, flips it during live game action for our social account, for our team accounts. And then we also use a service called Greenfly where we pass through a lot of the bespoke content of our players directly to their social platforms so they can upload. And that creates this full loop of where we're seeing elevated um, attention and interaction with our league through our players. So that is definitely a goal of ours. Hmm. So, Paul, some of the things that you're talking about, the ancillary portions of this, the social media, the you know personality of the players, the touch, the feel of the league, all of those things clearly very important when you're launching a brand, when you're launching a league for the first time. But the importance of making sure everyone knows this isn't an exhibition. Like this is not the Harlem Globetrotters. We're we're playing lacrosse very competitively, and guys want to go win a championship. How do you measure those two things, and like the importance of one versus the other as you launch a league in year one? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I would say they're mutually inclusive of each other. Okay, and uh, that's one of the questions that we were getting pretty early. Is oh, you know. Maybe the naysayers would say, ah, oh, these guys are so into social media and sport. And uh, I would say, hey, I, I agree. It all comes down to the competition on the field of that. Um, but if, if you don't highlight the player, uh, looks the like competition we're... on the field. I mean, last second shots and come from behind wins are as ephemeral as uh, you know, your ability to discern who it was. Once you know who that person was, and that come from behind win and that last second shot means more. Uh, so they're mutually inclusive of each other. And uh, our challenge is that look, this is our first year, so teams are, are are continuing to build culture, and fans are deciding who their favorite clubs are based on their favorite players, their favorite coaches, or the culture of winning and losing that that team's developing. And we're starting to see that now, and I suspect. With each coming game, we'll we'll see the allegiances build and build as as we will see the rivalries. But there's a, there's a part of being a startup where you just have to be objective. And uh, and one of the objective things I say pretty often and remind people is like, look, we can't and nor do we expect to have the Boston Red Sox versus the New York Yankees <laughs> right now. Like we don't have a, over a hundred years of competition. But I will say the that the previous league had a Boston team in a New York and. The rivalry wasn't there because it takes decades to create, and it creates, and it also requires a mass adoption. And our sport isn't big enough yet to to accumulate that level of distinct rivalry. The Hopkins Maryland one is ranked in the top ten of Sports Illustrated in all of sports, and uh, we leaned into that this past weekend a little bit as there were some Hopkins players and Maryland players on both of the Saturday night teams. Uh, but in the end, if you look at that, that's a hundred and ten plus year rivalry as well. So. We're doing the best we can, um, and that's why it's important that we index on social in addition to really showcasing, if you look at our content, the lion's share of it is highlights on field and 
the reaction of the players after wins and losses. We've got Paul Rabel for about another 8 to 10 minutes here on PLO Weekly, edition number one. Glenn Clark, Gary Stein with you, Paul Rabel with us from Los Angeles. Paul, staying with the players for a minute, uh, it's interesting. In the traditional sports leagues, obviously, player acquisition, right? Teams make trades. Teams put players on waivers. They acquire players. They sign players as free agents, etc. Your league right now in the non-traditional sense, do you have any of those mechanisms in place? Can teams trade players among themselves? Yep, absolutely. And and last week we just announced the opening of our trade window. Um, The only difference is... uh, is that you know we don't have individual team owners that are using or leveraging economics uh, to acquire a free agent. But frankly, we don't have free agents yet because all players are under multi-year deals that start in year one. So we will be announcing our form of of kind of economic trading to free agency in the future. But right now, we do have uh, a trade window that opened up last week. There was a big trade as Jules Hennenberg uh, went from the Whip Snakes to. Uh, the Redwoods and had scored eight points in huge his uh, game. first yep. game with the Redwoods, which yep. was huge. And there's a few other trades that are being announced this week. We have an existing waiver wire as well, and uh, where you have a big announcement coming up on Wednesday about a uh, uh, you know kind of a, a, a Baltimore great that um, that just entered the player pool and has been picked up by a club. So um, that all is a huge part of maintaining. You know, kind of the core principles of a, of a team sports league is enabling your coaches and their organization to best position their talent to make a playoff push. And as you get into the meat of the season, we'll see more of those transactions. The window closes in the third week of July. So wait, so you're saying that huge Baltimore player is going to be announced tomorrow, Wednesday. No, no shot of us breaking it here on the uh, PLL podcast. <laughs> I think I, would, I, I think I would aggravate our media team, but I'll give you guys some breaking news uh, right. in a subsequent show. <laughs> we'll accept that. We'll All accept right. that. Hey, let's talk about the first four, four weeks. You, you've been playing lacrosse since you were 12 years old. Uh, basically, you played in the MLL for 10 years. You were a two-time champion at Hopkins. What do you think about the first four weeks on the field? Well, I love the action. Um, you know, we've now played 12 games. This was our first weekend in Baltimore where there wasn't an OT game. So five of the first 12 games have gone into overtime. The teams are highly competitive, and I have never seen uh, games move as quickly and uh, be as spirited and as physical as the ones we're seeing now. So speaking as a co-founder of the league, uh, it's tremendous. And one of the things that we had always bet on with our investors was that, hey, if you kind of create an environment and on top of it roll out a red carpet for these guys, not only have they always played at the highest level when they were previously in the MLL, but if if you treat them well and pay them well, we're going to get some incredible work product in the PLL. And oh, and by the way, the games are on NBC, so that adds a little bit of fire um, as you got millions of people watching. Um, and so that's been really exciting. With, with regard to kind of Paul the player, we haven't gotten off to a great start with hmm. Atlas, and it's something that has uh, been frustrating. Uh, but if you look at a lot of these teams that were crafted, uh, many of which were done on chemistry. So either uh, you know a, a college association in bulk, like the Redwoods have Notre Dame and um, and the Whip Snakes in particular have close to 20 Maryland guys. Uh, we certainly have we have five Hopkins guys on our team, but the bulk of our roster, if you look at by position, is comprised of, and I think Atlas is probably the, the trickiest one. Uh, certainly uh, talented and well-established players with accolades and former championships, but guys who haven't played together before. Uh, and I'll give you another example: is you have the Chrome uh, Lacrosse Club that's struggling as well, surprisingly. Uh, given that their team was built pretty much after one of the former MLL teams, as we have a group of guys that uh, have played together over the last 10 years in professional lacrosse. So maybe it's a veteran bunch as to why they've uh, they've dropped a number of games, but uh, we were really strategic around putting these teams together and, and I think why we've seen so many tight contests. All right, we got to let uh, Paul go here in a couple of minutes because he's uh, literally scheduling out every minute of his day now as both a player and a man who's running a professional league. Uh, Paul Rabel with us on PLL Weekly. I need to ask about, because everybody in the lacrosse world has been talking to me about the fights, so let's talk about this. Are you sure. are you good with it? Are you encouraging it? Did you maybe say early on, like, this is fun, but I don't know that we want to be the league that's known for the fights? Like, where are you at as far as the fights are concerned? So I don't think... 
two things. We're, we, we're not going to be the league that's known for the fights. Um, I'm not sure the NHL is the league that's known that's for fair. the fights. It, yeah. It's certainly yeah, it's uh, changed. It's, yeah. fighting is certainly a part of the NHL. I would say the UFC is probably a league that's hmm. known for fighting. Um, I, I don't think we encourage it. Uh, we did showcase one of the bigger fights that happened in week three uh, between the Redwoods and Chaos Lacrosse Clubs. Uh, but I would say our, our media team, if you look at our social accounts and you look at our uh, YouTube and, and what we're putting out through our players, is we cover everything from goals, assists, defensive plays of the week, saves of the week, face-offs, hits, penalties, uh, coaching moments, mic'd up segments. And so when you have a, a, a particular moment in a game that changes the momentum and uh, you know, people uh, certainly were into it and had an opinion about it as you cover it, uh, but what we did uh, on the outset, just rewinding a little bit, is, look, there, there's always been uh, fights or scuffles that took place in, in professional lacrosse. And in the indoor game, it's, it's, it's legal to fight. Hmm. Uh, I should say you don't get ejected. Right. Right. Legal, so right. You still get a fighting penalty. Uh, so what we did is, is define a fighting penalty. So to do two things, one, uh, to acknowledge when a fight takes place, Let's penalize it and deeply penalize it. So it's a five-minute penalty in a 12-minute quarter. So if you're a skill guy, you don't want to end up in a fight. Uh, secondarily, it makes the rest job easier. Because when you have these scuffles that if a guy throws a punch, and then you can give him a fighting penalty. Um, now, we were very clear in our rule book around not being able to take off equipment and gloves and square up and fight. We just know that in a helmet and glove sport, that tempers flare, competition is heavy, six teams, ten regular season game that we'll see some tussles, and we just define some rules more deeply around it. So, um, you know, look, there's, there's a lot to learn. We're, uh, we're very uh, critical of, of the way that we've built the rules and established the framework, and we'll continue to uh, lean in more as, uh, as, as we learn about the way the game evolves, but I think we're in a pretty good spot. Paul, 30 seconds, true or false, the PLL will change the face of lacrosse. True. I think it already has. Hmm. Uh, we're talking about lacrosse on major outlets on a daily and weekly basis. Uh, you know, you guys have a PLL weekly segment now that's never existed. You're talking about professional lacrosse. Uh, so just overnight, we've changed the landscape. We have kids that send us letters and messages about how they're, they're keeping the stick in their hands because they want to play professional lacrosse now. I'll give you one more quick anecdote. I was in New York promoting the game at, with the Mets, and I was sitting with Pete Alonzo, who grew up in Florida and played lacrosse, and he chose to go baseball because there was an afterlife after college hmm. to play professionally, and he didn't see that economic opportunity previously in MLL. And so what I, what I tell Pete and others now is that we'll get the next Pete Alonzo because of what we're building. Wow, that sounds great, Paul. Really appreciate you, appreciate what you're doing, and uh, this is just the first PLL Inside uh, you know, weekly show, so we got 13 more to go. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Appreciate all your coverage. Absolutely. That's Paul Rabel, co-founder of the PLL, the Premier Lacrosse League, and this is the PLL Weekly. Uh, Glenn Clark and Gary Stein with you, and uh, I think now is probably about as good as time as any uh, because Paul was mentioning about the competition to tell people basically where the um, the standings are at this point. Uh, there are six teams in the league, the Whipsnakes, the Chaos, the Redwoods, the Archers, the Atlas, and the Chrome. Right now the Whipsnakes, which is uh, – generally populated with a lot of University of Maryland players. They're far and away. They're 4-0. and Now, keep in mind, these games are close. Nine out of the 12 games so far over the first four weeks have been decided by one goal or less. The Whipsnakes are 4-0. and They're in first place. Chaos is 3-1. and The Redwoods and the Archers are 2-2. Two and two. They're tied for third. The Atlas, which is Paul Rabel's club, 1-3. And, and the Chrome, as Paul was mentioning, a little bit surprising. They're 0-4. But again, the goal differential for the Chrome Chrome through the first four games is just minus seven. So uh, these are close games. They're fairly high-scoring games. There's a two-point goal, which keeps things interesting, especially late in games. Um, and the competition has been pretty good over the first four weeks. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I do need to address that if you and I are going to do this show, I have to be allowed to make fun of you every time you put your old man reading glasses on. <laughs> you have to be okay that every time. I, this is I, I only would, I only need them when I read just them. roll with it though. Like it actually makes it worse uh-huh. when you go to grab the glasses as you're looking to, to go over the standings, right? right? Like just wear them the whole show. You like that way I, I can't make do? fun of you when you go to put them on. But making fun of me is part of that the is show. part of the show. That is a good point. That is it's a little shtick. 
thick. So, yeah, right. As we say. Um, no, no, no. It's it's look the competition. Obviously, when you bring up the close games, I think that's been the biggest thing that's jumped off the page is that clearly these teams were structured very well. That they didn't structure a league in which they said, "Hey, we're going to sell out." To get all the guys, Paul brought up all the Maryland players for the Whip Snakes, and the Whip Snakes are off to a great start. Yeah, you know, not stunning. Maryland's produced a boatload of great players over the last few years, so we can't be that surprised by it. But it's not as if they're winning fifteen to three every week, and the games are unwatchable. They've clearly structured a league where the competition has been spread out to the point where the games are particularly close. Um, some overtime games involved in the mix, and that's. When you're trying to launch something, you want that. So it's a fine line. And, you know, obviously that's one of the things that Paul talked about. You want to get that geographical connection for a team, despite not being being a tour-based model instead of city-based model, but you still want there to be good competitive lacrosse. And so if you put every player from Maryland and Hopkins all on one team and said, hey, everybody that came from Maryland is going to be on this team, and we'll take everybody from the Southwest and put them on another team. Well, I think all of us, you know, I I know there was a kid from Arizona who played goal for Hopkins a few years ago, Pierce Bassett, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, But outside of that, it's not like there's an overwhelming amount of talent from the Southwest. I guess Matt Rambo is from Utah, or uh, sorry, Bubba Fairman now at Maryland's from Utah, so you could go that route. But they've clearly said, hey, we need to make sure that we spread out the talent so there's competition throughout. All right, sounds good. Hey, we're coming up on about halftime of the show here. We do have a second guest, and he's joining us, a local Baltimore product. Uh, I wouldn't say, RJ, you're a good friend of mine, but um, I've known you for a couple of years now. RJ Kaminsky is the uh, creator and the host of the PLL. He is becoming an overnight YouTube and internet sensation. And RJ, we welcome you to the show. How are you wow that was a, a really generous intro jerry i appreciate it i, I would consider us pretty good friends we, we <laughs> called a lot of shootout for soldiers games together we did years. we did that that is absolutely true and um proud of you first of all number one bo- boys latin product from right here actually almost a stone's throw away from where we're broadcasting from right now uh and then of course on to the university of maryland after that how did you land this gig what exactly happened so, so I was a journalism major at University of Maryland. I uh, was going to get into field reporting and broadcasting on the news side, um, but then was wow. presented an opportunity by a, a friend of mine who was hired as the general manager of the Lacrosse Network based in New York City um, for me to, to take some of my broadcast skills that I'd learned in college and start shooting a YouTube show in New York uh, working on the lacrosse field, a, a show where I'd be able to inject more of my personality into the content. And then I worked there with Tyler uh, for a year and a half, developing more connections in the sport, and then was uh, offered, you know, months back a position, a similar position, working in social media and creating a weekly show here at uh, the Premier Lacrosse League, and that's when I made the jump and made the move out here to L.A. to join the team. Well, let me tell you this. I was out there Saturday. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to be out there Sunday. I saw you working. I didn't want to disturb you because you were busy. (laughs) Uh, When you're working, okay, and this is behind the scenes, that you're behind the scenes, you put your all into this thing. Like you, you know, if there's one thing I know about you, when you're committed to something, you will give it 125%. Absolutely, and it, and it, you know, my my job. What makes my job easier uh, in shooting for for the folks that don't know is um, my my role, especially on site on the events uh, during the events each weekend, is to go around and create a vlog, uh, a video that encapsulates the atmosphere, um, a lot of the interactions between player fans and the players' families, and really bring the experience to those who weren't able to be there in person for the weekend. Um, and Saturday night at Homewood Field, mm. absolutely Crazy. had a had a level of uh, it was an atmosphere we had ne- we hadn't seen before yet um, in our PLL games. I mean, you couldn't fit another person in that stadium. Uh, whether you're in the beer garden or you were in the aisles trying to get to your seats, it was an incredible atmosphere. So it made the video that I was creating Saturday night much much easier. Even though it was um, it was overwhelming interacting with everyone there uh, on site, but it was uh, it was quite an atmosphere. So it made my my work a little bit easier. All right, RJ. First of all, I really like RJ. I need to great say kid. that I've always liked RJ. He's a great dude. Um, <laughs> this is this is the old man in me, right? And I'm not even as old as Gary is. <laughs> so I I there's this part of me that looks at a selfie stick and still makes fun of it, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm like, really, we're doing selfie sticks? I, is that just because I'm old and I don't understand? This is the way the world works. Or did you even have a moment where you're like? Am I going to be selfie stick guy? Like, is that going to be part of my... Di- like, this part of it is clearly working and everybody loves it. Is it just, I'm an old guy, I don't get it. Feel free to tell me that's the case. 
hundred percent. I, I get where case. you're coming from, and and what I'll, uh, what I'll what I'll counter the, the kind of re- the ridiculous look of, of holding a camera or phone out facing you and walking around and talking to it. Um, the 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 what we have in mind when we do that is the viewer at home, and whatever we can do to make the viewer feel like they are a part of the experience and they are being taken through a PLL weekend, and they are talking to and interacting directly with a PLL player. And that's what that vlog angle really delivers for us. It, it's almost as if we're, we're bringing the PLL experience into your living room or your office uh, or wherever you are, you're sitting and wherever you're consuming our content. So that's really where that comes from. And when I'm, when I'm, going up with a, when I'm uh, walking around with a player after the game and uh, we're, in, we're talking to each other, uh, and you know, bouncing off uh, you know lines of each other about you know whatever transpired in the game, uh, we're looking at each other. But then we're also looking directly into the lens and looking into the camera, um, which is when when you're the viewer, you're you're looking right into the eyes of the player. Um, and it, we feel that's much more personal than any kind of post game interview um, or player interview that comes from a different point of view. Um, so so that's that's the thinking there, Glenn. I tell you what, couldn't agree more uh, as a consumer of that. And like Glenn says, and Glenn, by the way, always says this, RJ, whenever he gets a chance, that I'm even older than oh, him. Oh, no, okay? that's because, significantly. It's like a staple of the show. Significantly. But, but, but regardless of that, okay, as a viewer consuming this, you're absolutely right. Uh, you feel, and this is something that the PLL does in general, you feel as a viewer, whether you're watching the game live, whether you're consuming the social media, that you're right there. You're right in the huddle. You're right on the sideline. You're right in the in the aisles. Wherever you are, we are, and that is something that I think you guys are bringing out. My question to to you is this: as you're going through, and you're four weeks in now, tell us something. Like, how do you pick the players? Like, tell us like who who are the biggest personalities that we should be looking for, and how have your conversations gone with these players over the four weeks? Hundred percent. That's a great question. Um, so I, I've had a chance be, uh, working in lacrosse, uh, you know, for for a, a, a pretty much my entire career through our nonprofit shootout for soldiers that I used to work for, and sure. at the lacrosse network, network where I was before PLL. Um, I've been able to foster relationships with some of the biggest pros in the game, guys that are guys that are, um, and since since those pros are some of the biggest in the game, they've had more experience and more uh, more time on camera. And as their experience um, goes up on camera and their, their time in front of the lens um, goes up, uh, they get better on camera. And when I say better, they're just more of themselves, right? Because the lens can be really intimidating for, for a lot of these athletes. So I usually like to go after, uh, at least uh, for, you know, at the end of one matchup, I like to seek out, uh, like, one of my top guys. So um, your Miles Joneses or your Trevor Baptiste. Guys that are probably going to be players of the game, like on the stat sheet, mm-hmm. but also players that have been in front of the lens quite a bit, um, where you know you're going to get a good soundbite out of them, and you know you're going to get them uh, when they're comfortable. But on on the other side of the coin, there we're always trying to reintroduce uh, or to introduce new characters um, and build new storylines, and that requires me going out and seeking out some of those other names that aren't necessarily uh, leading at the top of the stat sheet. So. Uh, after I maybe go out and get a Trevor or a Miles uh, or a Paul Rabel um, or, or any other big name there, maybe a Drew Snyder or Matt Rambo, I'm seeking one of the guys that, that also had a good game, but maybe our audience at home hasn't heard from them yet. Um, and since and as we're only in week four, um, we're actually I'm introducing this segment uh, with the Redwoods team where I go out and just spend time with about four or five guys that haven't necessarily been stars in the vlogs that week but we just get to know four or five things about them so our audience can continue to learn uh, all of these pros and a little bit of their backstory and, uh, and create a connection with them. So let me ask you this. As far as the Redwoods are concerned, they, they had a nice win over the Chrome this past weekend. Grant Eppel, the defenseman from Notre Dame, had a huge game. Ten ground balls, seven caused turnovers. Is, is he, by chance, one of the players that you may be uh, tracking? Oh, absolutely. Ethel's one of the players we'll be tracking. And he, he, had a, he had a lot of friends and family out uh, yeah. to the event this week. And he, you know, he's someone that, that's going to be, uh, this, that's, uh, it's funny, since he blew it up on the stat sheet, that's something that we'll be referencing this week as we're pushing that on social. And then uh, when, we get, when I go to get him involved next week in our media, that's something that we can reference and then pull highlights from. 
um, and push that storyline as Apple being one of one of the uh, one of the best guys out there and having one of the best performances. This is the fascinating part. RJ Kaminsky is with us, who is like Mister Social Media for the PLL. He joins us here on PLL Weekly. So, like, trying to both cater to the hardcore lacrosse fans who have been dying for something like this, right? Who this is their lifeblood, but also knowing that you're growing a league and a brand in a sport that to so many remains fairly niche, right? Like, how do you mm-hmm. cater and serve both of those audiences at the same time? So, so I think, uh, and I'll, this, this comes from the editorial side for our hardcore lacrosse fans, we put out weekly content from a ton of different writers, um, one of them in specific being uh, Joe Keegan, who puts out weekly content. For great, us. great job. And a lot great of that week. weekly editorial content is covers the X's and O's, uh, the strategies of all these individual teams. And we feel that content specifically, just on the editorial side, helps to satisfy those hardcore lacrosse fans that are looking for the X's and O's and the nitty-gritty of the week. But then, on the video side, we're always talking about reaching, uh, reaching that new consumer, that new potential PLL fan. And we think a lot of series that we do, there's player profile pieces, our mic'd up series. Um, we feel that those, uh, those assets are a, a real chance for us to bring in uh, folks to the, to the sport um, that haven't really given it a shot in the past. Um, so uh, our goal on the editorial side, that, that's, a, that's really one side specifically where we go after the hardcore lacrosse fan. But then on the video side, we're always looking to storytell around our pros, especially the ones that don't have uh, that, have, that have unique stories and that you know don't have your traditional oh I just grew up I got recruited D one and then I went and played college and they here, now here I am in the pros and I'll I'll stick on that example uh, Glenn uh, for for reaching new audience reaching a new audience and one of them is is one of our new stars Connor Farrell uh, mm-hmm. faceoff man for Chrome Lacrosse Club he he uh, he played D two football at LIU and is only the only uh, the only reason he's playing pro lacrosse now is because one of his friends, uh, who's on the lacrosse team, said, "Hey, uh, let's take it to the wrestling match. If if I can outlast you ten seconds in the ring, this is great. Uh, then you have to come out for the lacrosse team." So he challenged Connor, and Connor it took him eleven or twelve seconds to pin him. So he, he outlast he outlasted his buddy's bet. So the next day he was at lacrosse practice, and now Connor Farrell is one of the stars in the PLL after playing lacrosse for like one or two years in high school. Um, so that's an incredible story that we've been building uh, and pushing out, and one that we think can really help attract new viewers to our league. R.J. Kaminsky joining us here. We've got him for the next couple minutes. Uh, it's interesting, R.J., in, in our text conversation over the weekend, you reminded me that even though you were in Baltimore on Sunday, which is home for you, you would be back in Los Angeles on Monday. So I'm taking it that you guys fly back, you know, no matter where you are in the country, New York, Boston, you know, wherever you guys are, that your home base is Los Angeles. I know for a young guy like you, that's got to be pretty exciting, but it's also got to be a pretty tiring schedule week in week out oh absolutely i uh we we, we wrapped up uh, we headed to uh we headed to the airport by like 7 p.m uh i, I edited the vlog on the flight as it was going to go out you know every vlog goes out 8 a.m the next morning as well as all the other members of the media team were editing away on the flight and then getting all of our content scheduled to go out the next morning as you know our mission you know for what you know part, part of our mission with our media team is to continue to push the narrative of all the events that transpired over the weekend out on Monday and Tuesday um, in, make, in, in making sure that our audience is up to date on everything that's going on in our league, uh, whether that's a, what uh, went down after the first trade in PL history. Jules Henningberg went, from, uh, went to the Redwoods after being on the Whip Snakes uh, for the first four weeks, and then he, had, uh, then he put out the best stat line in PL history so far. Um, and so, of course, we went in, we got quotes from both coaches on the trade, and, uh, and we got quotes from Jules, and we'll be producing a video with Jules this week um, about, uh, you know, how it is, you know, with his new team and how his first game back with that team, he, you know, he blew it out of the water. Um, so our goal, um, to answer your question specifically, Gary, is to, um, so even though we're traveling late on those nights and flying back to the West Coast um, and preparing for next week, uh, those next 48 hours are crucial to us in getting media out and pushing those storylines and uh, making sure our audience is kept up to date with everything that, that went on during the weekend. RJ, what's your sell? Give me the, you know, you, you have a friend, you meet somebody who says, oh, you're working for the PLL. Like, I've kind of heard about that. I know it's sort of a thing that's going on, but 
I, I don't know either. I'm I'm sort of into lacrosse, like when my team plays and in, in college season. I don't really know if that's for me. What's your sell? Um, as you are a, a big face as part of this push and this launch of this new brand. Yeah, my uh, well, my my first my first suggestion would be to you know if they have any interest at all is to give us a chance on social media. Follow, check us out on Instagram and see some of the content we're putting out there. Or, 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 or just tune into one of our games, especially since our games are so much more accessible than they have been uh, in, in recent pro lacrosse. You know, we have a game every single weekend on NBC Sports. Um, and, and I've had, uh, um, more specifically to your question, Glenn, I've had family members of mine, um, even, even older folks that have never watched a lacrosse game in their life, tune in to the broadcast on, on NBC Sports and are just blown away by one how interactive the broadcast is, and two the level of play. Um, and, and these are these are coming from folks that really don't have an interest in the sport, Glenn. Um, so aside from them give, just giving them an elevator pitch by saying, "Oh, you know, these are the best pros in the game. Uh, these pros are more invested than ever, as they're getting paid four times as much, you know, than they did in the previous league." Um, and uh, aside from the, that pitch, I would just say, "Hey, give us a chance and, and check out the broadcast." Because more likely than not, they're going to walk away from the broadcast and go, huh, I'm going to keep my eye on that league. Or they're going to say, I'm, I'm sold. I'm going to pledge allegiance to a team and, uh, and keep following along. Hey, RJ, we're, we're going to let you roll. But before we do, and on that note, tell the fans how they can follow you. Where does your work appear and how can they follow you? Cool. So best place to get all of our content is our Instagram channel. Very simple, just at PLL. Um, just three letters on Instagram. And then same with YouTube, youtube.com slash PLL. Um, and then our Twitter handle is at Premier Lacrosse on Twitter. And we're just Premier Lacrosse League on Facebook. Um, it's the best place to keep in touch with our highlights, um, all of our series that we put out after the game. One series that I suggest you go watch that we just went live with on Instagram and YouTube and all the other, 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 all of our other platforms on Twitter, Facebook is our mic'd up series. Mm-hmm. Uh, a member of our team, Brett Roberts, shoots that. It's really, really incredible. You, uh, you get to be literally between the benches of both teams and get sound from both teams and listen to the ridiculous things that these guys are saying back and forth to each other, as well as what they're saying in the huddle. That's one piece of content I recommend you, you go watch if you uh, if you want to check us out. Well, I, I'll tell you this, RJ, from from a fan's perspective, and again, I grew up, you know, obviously with all the traditional leagues. You guys are onto something here, you know, and I know it's only four weeks in and it's only the first season. There's something different about this, obviously, and I think you guys may be onto something here. Awesome, I, I really appreciate that. Appreciate that, Gary, and that's you know, there there's so many potential fans out there as lacrosse is such a niche sport. That uh, we're you know we're looking to harness the power of this media team and uh, and attract those new fans and get them to give us a shot. On to Atlanta for you, my friend. Good good luck and hopefully we'll visit with you the rest of the way. Absolutely, sounds good, guys. Okay. I hope to see you the game uh, soon enough again. That, thank you. That's R.J. Kaminsky from Baltimore. Went to Boys Latin High School. Uh, went to University of Maryland, journalism major. He is the creator and the host of the PLL. And again, at PLL, just three letters, PLL. You can follow him on Instagram, and they shoot out a whole bunch of good content. As he said, 48 hours, within 48 hours of the games, they're out there on Monday and Tuesday shooting that stuff out, and uh, it is uh, it is quite the event. No, it's it's clear, Gary. This is They're trying to separate themselves they are. With, with this push. Now, you know, I, I say before, you can't be a social media company alone, right? Like, the, the content has to be good you've got to have a product the, the, right exactly right like just because you're good at social media um you know there's plenty of companies that have figured out ways to be good on social media that just can't compete with other companies within their own field and i'm not going to try to disparage any of them here because perhaps they might one day be fine sponsors of this program but like you get what i'm saying like there has to be something there so it's it, they're walking hand in hand they think that this is an area in which they can make up a difference and say in this world we think we can do this part better than other people have and we've reached out to people that have been doing that i think you and i both know what rj has been doing with shootout for soldiers a nonprofit that frankly a few years ago i don't know how much we really knew about them we didn't know anything about they really really blew up because they had young people around that had fresh ideas guys like rj who said let's push this out let's tap into things let's do things that work in 2016 and 17 and 18 and now he's moves on to the pl in 2019 I, it's it's a brilliant idea. 
you know, it doesn't guarantee success alone, but it's exactly what a company or a brand should be doing as they launch in 2019. All right, so we're going to wrap up uh, week one of PLL Weekly. I um, don't even have to put on. Oh, we're not going to make our picks for this week. We don't like. Well, uh, <laughs> well, so. I'm not going to even put on my glasses. To now wait you. a second. Yeah. Now wait a second. Know, That's my I'm favorite part of the show. I know I'm getting crazy here. Right. Okay, I don't need to put on my glasses to tell you that they're in Atlanta this yep. weekend. They'll be in D.C. the following weekend. And for ticket information, you can go right online, PremierLacrosseLeague.com. And I guess I mean we're all right there. We are based out of Baltimore. I know. Uh, you know, obviously, this is going to go to people all over the country. But for people in our local area if you've not been down the new Audi field uh in dc it's right next to the baseball stadium it is really gorgeous they've done a phenomenal job i think that's going to be an awesome location and like paul rabel's a gaithersburg guy so that'll be cool for him and clearly a lot of the maryland guys that played at dematha or played down that way it'll be really cool for them to play a home game down at the new Audi field in uh, dc every week we'll be here three o'clock on tuesday afternoons with PLL weekly this was week one Thank you, Glenn, for producing and co-hosting. It was awesome, my friend. Enjoy it. Uh, May you forever wear your glasses. (laughs) We have come to you from the Live Casino Hotel studio in Baltimore, Maryland. Glenn, thank you. I'm Gary Stein. We'll see you next week on PLL Weekly.